All right, so I have finally seen enough of this year's big movies that I feel comfortable presenting my personal top ten list. Wait a minute. Enough of? Yes, full disclosure, I still have yet to see Nightcrawler and Selma. I know, I know, those are big ones. I feel horrible about it, and I'm actively trying to see them. But unfortunately, I didn't see them in time to make the cut here. Also, I'm still getting over a cold, so forgive me for that as well. But now, time to get on to Beyond the Trailer's coverage of the top 10 movies of 2014, which covers them from every conceivable angle. You can click right here to see the top 10 movies at the box office, both stateside and worldwide. You're watching my personal list right now, and then next week you can see which movies you voted for, and the polls are still open. Just click on the link in the video description and cast your vote for what you think are the top 10 movies of 2014. And you have until the end of the day on January 4th. We're talking midnight Eastern Standard Time. And then again, look for the results right here on Beyond the Trailer. Now for my personal list, I decided this year to present it in a more personal manner. But because these videos run longer than my green screen videos, I've put up annotations with links to each entry. But I only put numbers up to, to still retain the element of surprise. And I hope there are a few good surprises for you here on this list. I was surprised with how uh, diverse it was. Lots of different genres, lots of different styles of films on here. And I think that 2014 ended up being a pretty darn good year. So we'll see if we agree at the end of this video. Now, number 10, The Edge of Tomorrow, which is known today on demand and streaming as Live, Die, Repeat. And that's a much better title for the movie. And I think if it had been released in theaters with that title and a better marketing campaign, uh, it might have gotten a box office gross that was worthy of the quality of the film. It still did pretty well, as you'll see in the box office top 10 uh, recap. It made it into the top 20 uh, worldwide. But still, that's a bit of an underperformer for Tom Cruise uh, in the kind of movie that it is. And also, again, how good it is. Now, the reason that it made it onto my top 10 list is because of the quality of the writing. There are a lot of good elements here, and they all come together very nicely, but I think the real standout for Edge of Tomorrow is the screenplay. It takes what could have been a really grating situation, you know, a Groundhog Day uh, scenario, but with like sci-fi action. You know, do I really have to watch that scene again and again and again? But it does that in a really exciting and unique manner, where the way they do the, the time jumping is really clever, again, unique, and funny. Edge of Tomorrow is a surprisingly funny film, and it reminds you of just how funny Tom Cruise can be. And I would say that Edge of Tomorrow is a lot like Tom Cruise, at least his per, uh, professional persona, and that he's smart, clever, and he knows what he's doing. And so does the movie, and I think that uh, they're both just really, really well done. I also think this could potentially be a standout film in years to come, because it could be the movie that got Emily Blunt the Captain Marvel gig. Uh, I think that her actual role in the film is a little underwritten. She's not really much of a facilitator. She's more of an assistant to Tom Cruise's character. You know, whatever. It is what it is. Uh, it's, some people say it's a strong female role. I digress on that, on that point. But I still think that she was very good in it, and she really did a good job of toning herself up and getting herself to look like an action hero. And I think she had a good um, demeanor in the film. So I think that Marvel very likely could be looking to that. She's already on their radar because she was their first choice for Black Widow back in the day before she had a scheduling conflict with Gulliver's Travels. But I think that we very well could look back and say Edge of Tomorrow was the movie that was responsible for giving us such a great Captain Marvel. We'll see if that comes to be. Uh, but that's another uh, another reason to like this film so much. Now, why is Edge of Tomorrow just number 10 if I love it so much? Well, I think that the happy ending they tacked onto it does the whole film a disservice, and that part of the film is very poorly written. So I have to give points off for that, and that's why it only makes it to number 10. But still, it made the list. All right, so number nine is The Theory of Everything. Now, you might remember when I first reviewed this film, I said that it was one of my favorite movies of the year, and it still is, obviously, but it's a little lower down on the list than you might have expected. And it's lower down on the list than I expected, and the reason that is is because I loved it so much that I went and I took my parents. But I have to say, watching it the second time around, it doesn't quite hold up. It doesn't quite have the same staying power. So I think if a movie can't even last two viewings, let alone multiple viewings, as it would have to if it's going to stand the test of time, I can't put it too high up on my top ten list. But I still think it's very good for two reasons. One, Eddie Redmayne's performance. He's brilliant in this movie. Really, really good. There are rumors that he has another great performance coming up next year, which is why the Academy might feel okay not giving him the win. 
I can't imagine what would be a better performance than this one, but uh, we'll see what happens with him in terms of the awards situation. But he'll definitely be nominated, and he's very deserving of it. And I think this movie puts him on the map as an actor to watch. But the other reason is, is that I think that the theory of everything is a surprisingly sophisticated view at life in general. You know, both the left brain and the right brain side of it, you know, arts and sciences, just like Stephen and Jane. But also that, you know what? Things, things happen. Things, not great things. You know, people fall in and out of love. They have disappointments. Life is very tricky. It hardly ever turns out how you think it will. And you just have to adapt. And that's what I like about this movie. It's a lot about adapting and just going with the flow. You know what? You might have hit a really big obstacle, but you're just going to have to find a way around it. And it might not be ideal, but you just, the name of the game is to keep going. And I thought that was really refreshing to see. And at the same time, <clears throat> it did it without like being like judgmental or angry. And I really, really appreciated that. So I, that's why the theory of everything still made my top ten list at number nine. Now, number eight is Maleficent, which I really enjoyed. Now, you might recall that I had some problems with the film, and I still do. I think it does a really bad job with its male characters. It totally sidelines Prince Philip, uh, the first really important Disney prince in Disney animation history. And, you know, I think that it's a little bit too rough on male characters in general. It really has nobody that's, uh, you know, a, a good example of the gender. And I think it really kind of builds on Frozen and how Disney's trying to break down its whole uh, formula and the way it's come to really uh, perpetuate the fairy tale myth. And I think they're admirably trying to get rid of that, but there are a few casualties uh, as they do so, do that, and I think it's male characters. But I think this is going to hopefully get fixed as we move along. But there are so many other great elements about the movie, and I just still remember watching it, and it was so exciting, both visually and emotionally. It had so many iconic moments, like scenes where you were just like, you know, talk about watching something again and again. I think Maleficent could be watched many, many times uh, and withstand the repeat viewing. I think Angelina Jolie created a character right up there with J uh, Jack Sparrow by Johnny Depp, and something that's going to last a long time, not just in terms of you know her persona as a, a Hollywood actress, but also in the Disney you know the Disney vault in terms of the stage, the stage shows, the theme parks, the way they present Maleficent. I think that this movie is going to change the way that character is shown, and that's that's the result of a good movie. Only a good movie can do that. And I think they got so much right in Maleficent, and I did like some of the feminist aspects of it. I, you know, I wish they didn't come at the cost of you know again the male characters, but that doesn't mean the messages that were being put out weren't necessary and important. So it's just the pendulum effect, and I think this was a very good film, and another really important strong step forward for the Disney fairy tales, the live action fairy tales. And I think they're just getting stronger and stronger. And when I think of how good Maleficent is, it makes me more excited for Cinderella in 2015 and The Jungle Book in 2015. And this is just a brand, as I said with my Into the Woods review, uh, you know, Disney live action fairy tales, that I'm beginning to trust as much as you know, the Marvel movies, which is also from Disney. So I really liked Maleficent a lot, and that's why I think it deserves the number eight spot on my list. All right, now number seven is Whiplash. And this movie has also dropped a few spots on my list since I reviewed it, because it doesn't have a lot of staying power with me or with just the media. I mean, this is the film that everybody's forgotten, basically. And it's a shame, because it's a very good movie, but you have to factor that in to its overall image. You know, Whiplash is a movie that just doesn't stay with people. It doesn't have a lot of staying power. But I still put it up at number seven on my list because I can't forget how I felt while I was watching the movie and right after I finished watching it. And I thought it was incredibly powerful, as again you might recall from my review. I have never seen a film do such a good job capturing what it's like to take on a career in the arts, or tentatively take on a career in the arts, to decide to follow that path. Often Hollywood, because it's presented by people in the arts like to romanticize it and be like, oh, you just fall into it and it's so easy and you're swept into some artist community that's so supportive and you're just an overnight sensation and you're, you know, rich immediately. And I think that Whiplash shows the reality that you're getting this for the long haul. It's not a sprint, it's a marathon. You know, there are angry people there that you have to pass. You know, there are people who are difficult. You have to navigate that. You have to navigate yourself because so much of your success is going to rely on your self-discipline. I mean, that's a key element in having a career in anywhere in the arts. And I think Whiplash does a fantastic job uh, highlighting that. I really like the film. And again, that's why it's number seven on my list. Now, number six, I have my notes here. Number six is the Grand Budapest Hotel. I just love Wes Anderson's little box of European chocolates. The movie is just like looking into a quirky snow globe. And you know, the other thing is not only is it a good movie, but when you watch The Grand Budapest Hotel, you're watching a director break out of their box, break out of his snow globe. Wes Anderson is realizing that he can do 
other types of movies. He doesn't have to just do, you know, dramedies. This, for instance, is a mystery thriller, and he does such a good job at it. The Jeff Goldblum chase scene is genuinely frightening. And he also, that's another thing, uh, he's worked with Jeff Goldblum before, but he brings in lots of new cast members, which I think is also really appreciated, showing that he doesn't have to have, like, his little, you know, uh, company of uh, the actors like a theater company, but instead can just really try and make bolder moves on the big screen. And so I'm excited that Wes Anderson's thinking bigger, that he can think bigger, and I can't wait to see what he does next. I mean, basically, The Grand Budapest Hotel isn't just a good movie, but it takes a style of filmmaking, and that's Wes Anderson's, which is very distinct, and takes it from being stale and makes it suddenly, again, a breath of fresh air. So I think that's very exciting. And again, I use that metaphor of a, a little box of uh, European chocolates because the movie just made you feel a certain way. And I do remember that I was listening to a lot of like classical like waltz music, like from Johann Strauss, etc., after seeing the film, because it just gave me such a strong, sense of being there and that's really hard to do and commendable and so I think the Grand Budapest Hotel is just a fantastic film it's also a very well acted film and Rafe Fiennes I hope is remembered awards uh, during award season he's remembered uh, Golden Globes remembered him but I'd like to see him show up at the Oscars as well when they you know the categories combine into not just comedy musical versus drama but just one category for best actor I think Rafe Fiennes really deserves to be there, or however the heck you pronounce his name. Uh, he, why, doesn't he why don't you pronounce it like you spell it, Ralph? All right, so that's my sixth favorite film of the year. Now, number five, I think this is a surprise to me, and that's Into the Woods. You know, I held off making this list because I had a couple of movies I needed to see, namely Into the Woods and Unbroken. Unbroken didn't make it, but Into the Woods not only made it, but it made it to number five. It passed Maleficent. Why is that? I mean, it's certainly not as a, a heavy a special effects film as Maleficent, and it has a strong message, but it's not, it's not as strong, it's not as, um, you know, prickly as Maleficent. It isn't as feminist. I think it has strong messages for everybody of every age, every gender, etc., which is probably why it's higher up on my list. But the other reason it's up high on my list is that it was one of the few movie musicals that I've seen recently, which I think is a good adaptation of the original source material. So often today you see musicals and they just seem like fan service. Like, oh, the fans love this musical. Let's just get it up there. And it's not particularly well uh, adapted. But I think Rob Marshall here, you know, showed the talent he did originally with Chicago, not so much with Nine, that he's able to masterfully bring a, 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 a musical from the stage to the big screen. I mean, I was humming, because uh, I, I don't really know all the words, but I was humming the tunes and thinking of the different scenes that I saw in this film long after I watched it. It really did stick with me. And so it was just a really handsomely mounted production. And I feel it's a musical up there with like My Fair Lady, The Sound of Music, Cabaret, one of those really great musicals that will stand the test of time. Now, I know some people don't like the third act, but I think it's important, you know, don't tune out because things get, you know, maybe not quite as well constructed. You know, maybe maybe it's not as tightly, the narrative isn't as tight as we would like. But don't let that, uh, you know, distract you from some really important messages that the, the musical is trying to get across. They're very strong, they're very good, and it's, it's a very good production, and I really like it a lot. And again, I think it's not only good as a movie, but as a musical adaptation for film. So I really liked it a lot, and that's why it's number five. Also, fantastic performances, very strong cast across the board. Another uh, great example of an ensemble cast where everything's working in front of and behind the camera. That's hard to do, but we actually saw it happen a lot this year, as you're going to see as my list continues. All right, now number four. This would be the Lego Movie, and it's my only animated movie on the list. And that's because I thought this was the most original animated movie of the year that wasn't just going for like commercial dollars. You know, I think that you know, there were some good animated movies this year that I really enjoyed, but I think animation, there's so much money in that field right now. Uh, the, the family audience is just so potent and they're willing to go out for a number of movies that I think the majority of animated movies, you know, they lower the bar to get the biggest audience possible. But what was so great about the Lego movie is that it was able to keep that bar high but still get a huge audience. And it's just a surprisingly sophisticated film. I mean, I remember seeing a quote from uh, Phil Lord and Chris Miller saying, you know, I want it to look stupid, impressive, but still dumb. And that's exactly how the movie is constructed. Get it constructed like Legos? And that's just really commendable. This is a film that captures what it's like to play with Legos at every age. And that's, real, that's, that's another great thing about the movie. It's so rare to see a commercial film, and this one's like pretty much literally a commercial for Legos, perfectly capture 
what makes the brand that it's it's advocating so popular. I mean, Legos are, are so popular, have been around for so long, they're really a part of our, you know, pop culture, you know, tapestry at this point. And the Lego movie plugged right in there and got to the heart of what makes Legos work for people and what makes a Lego builder tick. And also about play, you know, wanting to play and the importance of imagination. I mean, these are themes that I think that Toy Story has also tried to tackle, sometimes successfully, not sometimes not so successfully. And we'll see how the Lego movie does as it becomes a franchise. But just like the first, I guess that's a good comparison. Just like the first Toy Story so many years ago, I think the Lego movie is the Toy Story for today. And it just really is incredibly well done and sophisticated at every level. And kudos, again, behind the camera and in front of the camera, or in this case, the voice actors. Everyone does a stellar job. And I really love this movie, and I think it deserves the best, uh, best animated feature Oscar that it's uh, the front runner for at the moment. <clears throat> All right, so number three. Some of you didn't like it. Some of it probably, some of you probably wouldn't even put this anywhere near your top ten list. But I think Mockingjay Part One from the Hunger Games franchise deserves to be number three because, again, you might notice that on this list, I'm picking a lot of movies that think outside the box. They change up the status quo. They take something familiar and they add elements to it or look at it from a different perspective that makes it fresh. Uh, it, it's again, it's a challenge to the genre, to the audience, to the filmmakers, to the actors, to everyone involved. And I really, really think that's important. And I think that Mockingjay does that and that it takes a film that's aimed at the young adult audience and it introduces these wonderful themes like political intrigue, uh, you know, uh, propaganda, the pressures of being a leader, you know, to a, a group of people like the Katniss has to explore, that also President Coyne is exploring, Snow is exploring, they're all exploring this at the same time. That's, again, incredibly sophisticated. And I thought the way they handled, you know, the situation with PETA at the end and the, you know, post-traumatic stress disorder, you know, all the psychological elements of the more fun things that we associate with action movies. And I think it... I think the result was something that was equally fun. Now, not everybody agrees. And again, some people wouldn't put Mockingjay anywhere near their top ten list. But for me, it's number three for that reason. Because I think it's a really intellectual, bold film that tries to elevate the, the genre, young adult audiences, and I think it succeeds. So I really like that film quite a bit. All right, now we're getting down to the final two. Number two, very similar to Mockingjay, and that's Captain America the Winter Soldier, which again, introduces political intrigue and those uh, same themes to the Marvel Cinematic Universe, and I feel quite successfully. I also really admire this film because I think it finally defined Captain America as a character. Now, I know there are a lot of Cap fans out there who, who will say, oh, you just didn't get Cap. Cap has always been really well defined. He's a great character. He's lasted for so long because he's such a great character. And I would argue that Captain America's had a hard time crossing over into the mainstream, outside of comic books. He's always had his fan base, but people like me, and I'm a comic book reader even, just have never gotten Cap. And I think that Chris Evans and the Russo brothers and Kevin Feige and everybody over at Marvel have finally elevated him. You can see it in the press materials. People finally care about, about Cap. I mean, remember when Avengers came out? Everyone's like, why is anyone listening to Cap? Everyone should just listen to Tony. But now we have a situation where Tony actually, you know, Robert Downey Jr., even in real life, feels threatened by Captain America slash Chris Evans. And you see him muscling his way into Captain America 3 to make sure that he exerts his domination, and at least they share the Marvel Cinematic Universe. So I thought that was a really important aspect to Captain America the Winter Soldier. Then the other thing is, is that the diversity of the supporting cast. You had a situation where you had multiple characters uh, of varying diversity, you had multiple ethnicities, you had multiple, you know, men and women, there's only two genders, and then you also had um, different age, age ranges, you know, Robert Redford is in there really well. You had all these different types of people put into the film, well developed, so no one was a stereotype, and I think that was really impressive. I think that should become the status quo for these big movies going forward. You know, I really thought that was important, and I love that about the movie. And then finally, the Russo brothers knocked it out of the park. I can totally understand why they're being considered for, uh, for directing uh, the Avengers 3. I think they did such a great job with Captain America the Winter Soldier. And they had multiple action sequences in there that it, as you were watching them, you were like, I can't wait to watch this again. I've seen it again. It holds up. And I also want to reference something that Steven Soderbergh said. He made a he made a uh, observation about today's audiences in the big comic book movies. And he said, I was at an airport and I saw a man, you know, in his mid-30s looking at his iPad, looking at movies. And I was like, hey, that's the target demographic of Hollywood. That's the ideal demographic. Let's see what he watches. And he said, to his disappointment, this gentleman 
had brought up a comic book film and was fast forwarding through all the talking parts, all the story, just to get to the set pieces because he wanted to see the big action sequences, which were, of course, really impressive. But the great thing about Captain America the Winter Soldier is that it has those amazing action sequences throughout the film, not just one or two, but throughout. But it has a great enough story, not just great enough, a great story to make you want to not fast forward from action piece to action piece. It's really good. The whole thing is good. So I think that that is why it deserves second place. So what could beat it? You probably already know, but my favorite movie of the year has to be Birdman. And that's because it's the only film that I saw, not just this year, but, you know, in recent memory, that I felt that's a movie people will be studying in film school. This is a film that will not just be remembered for all time, but will become something that people pick apart to understand how to make movies better going forward. I mean, we're talking like a Jaws here, which was also a very simplistic movie. And I think that's beautiful that to remind people in a special effects you know, era of filmmaking that sometimes when you just let a movie breathe, you know, a film that's all one long take, sometimes you can get the best results. Literally, my favorite movie of the year and probably, you know, a very good chance it's going to be named the best movie of the year by multiple awards shows, potentially even the top one, the Oscars. So I love that aspect of it, that it was something that was for the ages and its, its simplicity made it, you know, something that I guess basically the reason I think you can study is, it, it, is that it's a perfect example of every aspect of filmmaking, of lighting, of directing, of, you know, cinematography, uh, of acting, of set design, you know, everything. Now, also speaking of writing, another thing I like about Birdman is that I think it's a perfect snapshot of what the entertainment industry has become today. And even more than that, you know, meta movies have done this for quite some time. Hollywood makes a lot of meta movies. They love them. Barton Fink, Sunset Boulevard, Singing in the Rain, uh, The Player, Swimming with Sharks, all these movies. But there's usually like kind of an angry, an anger, angry quality and a bitterness to them. But Birdman, it doesn't judge. It's not bitter. It just presents it as is. And it's a fully uh, articulated, fleshed out argument to present how the what Hollywood has become right now. And then you can just, you can approach it how you want to. And I think people will probably look at that movie in different ways and see different things, different points in their career, people who are just in different places right now. And they'll all get something different from the movie. And that's also a really well-constructed film. Now, finally, I have to say, I told somebody, my friend, uh, one of my friends, my very good friend, that this was my favorite movie of the year. And she said, well, Grace, you told me that you, you know, I asked you what the end of the movie was, and because I don't know what it is, she said, and <clears throat> I couldn't, you couldn't tell me, I couldn't tell you, how could a movie that you don't know what the ending means be your favorite movie of the year? And I would say, except for the very last, you know, bit of the film, I don't want to ruin it for anyone who hasn't seen it yet, but for the, I'd say the last few seconds, I totally see what's going on, and I'm not willing to disqualify that brilliance, because at the end, I'm like, I'm not, maybe it goes over my head, maybe... Uh, you know, Alejandro and Arrigo uh, didn't really know how to end it. <clears throat> you know, there are all these uh, different arguments for why it is what it is. But I'm curious, I would like to know if any of you feel you totally 100% understood the ending to Birdman. And, you know, put a spoiler, spoiler though, so you don't ruin it for anybody else. But also, I think maybe that's just the wonder that plays into it. And, you know, even take a stab at it. Even if you don't think you totally understand it, uh, I'm, I'm open to hearing theories and maybe we can all come to a consensus together. But still, Birdman is my favorite movie of the year. So, those are my top 10 movies of 2014. Please not only share your list down below, but don't forget to go and vote. Uh, the more people that vote, already a ton of votes have come in, but the more that people vote, uh, the better the results video will be. I will tell you right now, Marvel is fighting out for one and two, so if you want to get in there and pick uh, Guardians or uh, Captain America, get in there, or if you want to try and get another movie up there to the top, uh, be sure to cast your vote by midnight at the end of the day on January 4th. All right, thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed my top 10 movies of 2014, and I look forward to discussing them with you down below. Thanks for watching. Bye.